All right, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to the Heritage Foundation. Happy Friday on a uh, Memorial Day weekend where we honor our nation's uh, dead that have died in our wars. Um, thanks so much for coming today. I would ask you to uh, double check, verify that your cell phone, your, your little computers or whatever you have is on a, a silent mode. My name is Tom Spore. I'm the director of the Center for National Defense here at the Heritage Foundation. Delighted you're here. I'm an Army officer, farmy, former Army officer. That's good news for you because if JV goes too far into the area of thrust vectors and things like that, I'm going to pull them back into something uh, that I understand. So our focus today is on a brand new Heritage Foundation report titled, The F-35A Fighter is the Most Dominant and Lethal Multi-Role Weapon System in the World. Now is the time to ramp up production, written by J.V. Venable, who I'm sharing the stage with, is going to be discussing that report today. Not a uh, typical report that you see in the Washington, D.C. Uh, think tank uh, community. Usually those types of reports are based on uh, assessments of open source type material. This is uh, different, and so we'll talk about that. Hopefully you've all gotten a report. If you wanted one, they were available in the lobby. Our focus today is going to be on the F-35A, the Air Force variant. Not to say that JV doesn't know about the other variants, but that's that's kind of how we're going to approach this. And in the Q&A, maybe if you have a question about one of the other variants, we could talk about that. Some have called the F-35 program the most expensive weapon system ever uh, aspired to be produced by the United States. I don't I don't know that that's true, and and it all really people cut this thing in all kinds of different ways. You can cut it in a 50-year chunk or a 75 year, what, however you want to cut it, it's an expensive program, one of the most expensive programs in our nation's history, and so therefore very much deserving of our scrutiny, our attention, and thus the uh, our focus today. Um, our format, we're going to, JV and I will probably talk back and forth for around uh, 40 minutes or so, and then we'll uh, turn it over to you and see what kind of questions you have uh, uh, that are on your mind. And then at the end, there. I think there's going to be a light lunch in the lobby for us where you can continue if you'd like to pursue uh, JV until he finally escapes. Um, and so about JV, JV Venable is a C senior research fellow here for defense policy focusing on aerospace issues. He's a 25-year veteran of the Air Force who served in three combat operations, retired in 2007 as a command pilot with more than 4,000 400 hours of flying time and 300 of those hours in combat, principally in an F-16. He commanded the Air Force's Aerial Demonstration Squadron, the Thunderbirds, from 2000 to 2001. So good morning, JV. Thank you, Tom. Yeah. Um, so this is not your first report on the F-35A. You wrote a report back in August 2016, kind of followed a similar uh, format. Can you Talk for a moment about that report and how it's different uh, from the report we're discussing today, as well as uh, other F-35 reports that come from think tanks across the town here. Yeah, Tom, my pleasure. And uh, Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be with you. Um, I'm going to do my best not to talk with my hands this morning and to use uh, my standard uh, four-letter limit on words uh, as we go forward. If I hit you with an acronym, please raise your hand, and, and I'll know that I've stumbled, and uh, we'll go back. Uh, I came to Heritage uh, uh, about four years ago, and uh, when I was uh, entering this organization, one of the most controversial um, topics in D.C. with regard to the Air Force was the F-35. And I, as a fighter pilot, former fighter pilot, I was very skeptical of the system, and I actually wanted to know more. And so I engaged the Air Force, asked if I could go to a couple of, of our training locations, and we had no operational uh, base at that time, and engaged fighter pilots. I ended up interviewing 31 of them, and they were very experienced. Each one of them had been an instructor in another platform, F-16, F-15, F-15E or A-10, and most of them had credentials well beyond that, either a Sandy uh, uh, pilot from uh, the A-10 community or, or weapons school. And if you look at that paper, it's still online. The vast majority of folks were uh, weapons school or test pilot uh, uh, folks, which is pretty incredible. In engaging them and asking them basic questions about their previous airplane, I got them to basically come to terms with uh, with this, uh, this, this person who was intruding in their space. 
as much as you might think fighter pilots are welcome in any fighter community, that's not true. We are just as as uh, protective as you would uh, would would find in any other uh, elite organization. And so you kind of have to walk your way in. And by asking them uh, questions about their airplane, I ended up getting them to talk more and more, Tom. And I found that uh, when I went into the F-35 discussion uh, to follow and ask them the same battery of questions, those uh, those pilots were grounded basically on the thought process of what they had said about their previous airplane, and I had fought all of them in the air. And so this is the exchange, and when I came out of that report, I had a really positive impression, uh, at least from them, about what they were flying. And that led into this one. That uh, paper was written on an airplane that was s truly in the developmental stage. We call it IOC, or Interim Operating Capability. And, uh, and today, uh, as of last summer, actually, um, the uh, Lockheed Martin and the Air Force fielded the combat coding into the jet, the software and the hardware combination that allows fighter pilots now to go out and actually operationally employ that jet. And the reason why I came and did the second paper, Tom, was to find out how the airplane had improved or had not improved uh, over the course of that time. Interesting. So... Uh, I'm fascinated by this. Tell us, tell the audience, how did you go about researching? How did you get access to pilots? Because, you know, here we are in Washington, D.C., getting to sit down with an Air Force pilot on active status. I, that could not have been easy. I'm interested in how that went, and, and what, was that hard? Well, it was, uh, I wouldn't say it was hard. It was fascinating as a fighter guy. Um, I had flown an F-16 for the vast majority of my career, and the F-16 had a radar, which was pretty capable for its day. It had a, a self-protection system. It had some offensive weapons. It had some defensive countermeasures. But they paled in comparison to what I was reading about the number, just the number of systems that were on the F-35. And so going in and doing my homework on what this distributed aperture system was, um, I, I had never heard of it. I really uh, dove into it. And basically what it is, is it's a port kind of like a camera that looks in every direction of the F-35. And it just allowed me to understand the fundamentals. And then when I was talking to the pilots, I could ask them about it in a, in a well-formulated um, and well-grounded way. Uh, with my background, I could go in with, with that plus my hat in my hand and saying, I'm a little bit ignorant on this. Could you help me understand how this system works and how it's doing for you? And then they started becoming uh, very forthcoming. And so I really enjoyed that. And then I enjoyed the engagements beyond because when you ask fighter pilots about the most important things in their life, you talk to them about their family and they, they'll they actually tell you all of the great goods and the wonders of it. When you ask them about their first love in the Air Force and that fighter that they flew before, they really start opening up. And if it's, this is their second love, meaning the second uh, fighter that they flew, then that comparison becomes really a holistic and uh, a very enjoyable to, uh, to go in and, and cipher through. Great, JB. And, and so uh, here's a question that's foremost, I think, and that is how do you know these pilots were being completely con candid and honest? You know, I know uh, sometimes you'll get a person uh, that will be tempted or even their command chain will will want them to not stray off the party line so I'm, uh, and that happens in the army so I'm not that's not a particular to any service but how do you know you were getting the straight gouge from these guys well the first was the reception and when I walked in and each one of them looked like I was uh, I was an alien and and I, I had no place there then I knew I was in the right place and I knew that I was talking to the right person and if I could get them to talk about their previous airplane and talk to it in a detail where I could trigger a couple of, of thoughts, then that was great. And so I'd ask them a battery of questions, and I would go, if you're going to rate the F-16 radar on a scale of zero to five, how would you rate it? And they would go, five. And I would go, okay, um, how about visibility? Five. Okay, well, nobody gave me those firewalled answers, but when they gave me a five for visibility, meaning in the F-16, incredible glass cockpit, you could look all the way around you, you could look down out the side, it's just, and it, it was like being in the Wonder Woman aircraft almost, where you had just incredible visibility. 
when I went into the F-35 questions, I asked them the same battery of questions. And question number two or number three was, talk to me about the visibility. On a scale of zero to five, what's the visibility? And if they gave me a five, then I said, you know, I, I thought you flew the F-16. You said that that had the visibility of a five. You've got a big bulkhead you know, back behind you, and you've got this bow in front of you. Are you sure you want to rate that as a five? And they would go, oh, oh. And that was the grounding element with which they started correcting themselves over. And so at the end of it, I, I can tell you, I felt very confident that each person gave me the honest gospel truth of what they were thinking about with regard to the performance of both their previous jet and, and the, uh, the F-35. The other thing is I went to fighter weapons school and I, I got to like several people in this room, max perform an airplane. And when you, when you do that, you basically park it and you stand it on end. You're not moving forward. You're kind of not climbing. You're kind of not going downhill and you're jousting with someone else. I knew all the air speeds. I knew how to beat the other airplanes, the F-15s, the F-15s, E-model, the A-10 or other F-16s. I knew how to do that. And so when they were talking, I could relate and said, you know, I, I got to about 118 knots. That's all I could get. What did you get out of the Viper? And then they would start talking. You know, I, I flew a bigger engined uh, version than you did, and I could actually get down to about 115. And that really, it just changed the paradigm of the, and the, the overall atmosphere in the conversation. So I felt confident to, to, to bottom line. So, and this is a sensitive subject, but so, um, how do we know Heritage and you don't have any kind of vested interest in making the F-35A look good? I mean, that's always, I'll be honest, as a consumer of other think tank stuff, I always want to know that. Who, who paid for this report? Uh, who's interested in it? Yeah, so this was all Heritage funded. I think uh, the Heritage Foundation gets a small amount of money, something between ten and $20,000. There's probably somebody in the, in the room that could answer that on, uh, with, from Lockheed Martin. But our donor base is almost all uh, comes from um, the, the mom and pop contributor. And so the dwarfing mechanism there is, uh, is that from this organization. But for me, I, I, I'm a fighter pilot, and if you told me I had to, I probably wouldn't. You as my boss would know that better than anybody else. And so uh, with the idea of going in and in engaging the, the, the F-35, I gave a really uh, honest report. And I'll tell you, this is kind of the back uh, backdrop on the Lockheed Martin relationship. And I know we've got a couple of folks here in the room from Lockheed Martin. But when I wrote this report, it really, the first one, it changed the paradigm of the way people in the city viewed the aircraft. And it was 31 folks, all fighter pilots weighed in, and they said, this is a really good airplane. And when they, that happened, I became well, one of the, the poster child children, I think, within Lockheed Martin. I think they really enjoyed the report. It was honest, but it was very favorable to their platform. About eight months later, um, we wrote an NDAA, a national, uh, um, a, what is it? Uh, national, Defense. national Defense Authorization Act. And my recommendation in that was to cut the purchase, for the Air Force to cut the purchase of the F-35 from 1,763 airplanes down to 1,260, basically cut it into two thirds. And as you can imagine, I went from being a hero in Lockheed Martin to going into the GOAT scale. And so it's honest analysis, it's my view, and uh, I know that uh, Lockheed Martin may or may not enjoy this paper, but it's an honest paper, and it, and it came from someone who wouldn't have it any other way. Okay, great. Well, so that's, uh, we've set the stage here. Let's, in your paper, you broke it into the jet, uh, the simulator, uh, uh, maintenance and logistics, and operations. If you would, let's talk about the jet. Okay, um, the jet is, uh, is doing very well. And I, I'll uh, throw up a matrix for the folks in the audience, and I'm not sure that folks in, in the world of C-SPAN 2 can actually see this, but you've got the aircraft, the simulator, maintenance and logistics, and then operations. And those are the areas of a weapon system that you want to look at. This time, I wasn't just looking at the jet. But I was looking at the fighter itself to see how it improved. And it is, without a doubt, I walked away from the conversations, these 30 fighter pilots that are flying the, the combat version of the software and hardware, they feel it is the most dominant multi-role fighter in the world. 
without a doubt, it has more situational awareness cues. Pilots, when I was flying and you checked and you turned away, your radar uh, turned away from the threat, you would have to look out the window and find a speck on the horizon, and that would be a fighter. If that fighter fired a missile at you, that would be an even smaller speck, and it was up to you to find it and survive or not find it and die. This airplane, the situational awareness cues, you can actually turn and your helmet will give you a display with a box over it of where that fighter is. And if he fires a missile, it'll show you where the missile is too. And that level of situational awareness just from an air to air perspective is unbelievable, but it has so many other tools that are not air to air oriented, they're air to ground oriented. It can find, fix, identify, uh, target and engage targets on the ground faster than any other weapon system in the world. And it does that through a variety of sensors. This is what I was told over the course of my discussions is when you get a hit with fighters flying out um, uh, side by side, maybe several miles separating them, they often get a, a, some radar or some system will actually come up uh, and start emitting. And as soon as it does, those two fighters will be able to triangulate exactly where that system is. And the AESA radar, this incredible ground mapping radar that they talk about, will slew over and actually map that ground and show you in a visual image as opposed to a radar depiction, the old school, exactly what that, that target looks like. And it will allow that entire flight to actually target and then go in and drop bombs on specific designated points of impact on that target. And this is what each of the pilots said. And so I won't go into any further uh, into that, but the pilots in an operational sense, and then this is, I'm talking about you're beyond the friendly line, you're in enemy territory, and you're going and engaging air to air and air to ground threats. The pilots that I, I talked to would rather not be in any other airplane their previous airplane, or, or any other that they could think of on the planet than the F-35. That's the good side. Now, on the bad side, on the right side, or the not so good side, you have um, a, a concern that most of the pilots echoed. And this was the helmet that, that folks have. Let me see if I can get, would you call up, uh, Will, slide number six, if you would? Let's see if it can come up. There's the helmet. So an average fighter helmet, the one that I had, was basically a, a, a protective device. It had a hole up here where you could look out of and visors that you could pull down over your face, but nothing except um, uh, sunglass protection came down or a clear visor at night. That's all we had. When we started flying at night, we had to put a night vision goggle set and you would have it up on your head like this. And when you started flying at night, out of a, of a very lit area, you would crank those goggles down and it would be like two binoculars like you see out in front of this gentleman on the screen. That binoculars weighs about a pound, a pound and a half now. And the, the, the visual that you get out of that is actually pretty good. It's got about a 2040 acuity. So if you got 2010 eyesight like I do distance wise, then this will basically dilute that down to about 2040. And that's what you see. And those NVGs or NOGs is what we call them. They're getting better and better over the years, but still you've got this big honking device out there. It weighs a pound. If you turn the airplane and you apply G-forces to the jet, every uh, pound under four Gs weighs four pounds. You multiply it by the G number and that gets a lot of leverage on your helmet. The other thing is you're always looking left or looking right in the jet. And with me in the F-16, the glass was right here and I was always beating up that plexiglass with that, that, uh, that night vision goggles. So big ad, but they, they detracted from this and it's kind of like always having something on your back, right? It's always something there that you have to think about. The other thing about it is you've got these binoculars there, but if you look in the cockpit down, you can't see anything with it. Your map, any of the dials in the cockpit or the heads up display. And so you had to look underneath. You just shifted your gaze underneath it in order to see what you want. And so with the, the um, 
the uh, F-35, what they decided to do was build uh, an HMDS, um, a helmet-mounted display system. And, and those in the audience can see here that it's basically a, a little bit larger helmet, but in it comes all of the bits and pieces that you would find in a fourth generation airplane. That heads-up display that you would find in a, in a fighter is there. But go back here to look at this, uh, the night vision goggle thing is no longer an issue. Right here in the center of their forehead, they have a, a high resolution night vision device, and it basically projects onto that visor there, the helmet mounted display system. It projects in there, but it also, that display system also factors in the, the flight data, the targeting data, um, the, uh, the distributed aperture system we talked about a little bit before. And this graphic will give you an idea of what it looks like. Basically, it's six ports on the airplane. They look out in all directions. And in that helmet, you can turn your head and look, and it will show you what the airplane is seeing. But you can toggle a switch and look through the floorboard of the airplane and see underneath the jet. You can actually look and see through the engine, any quadrant that you want to look for. It genuinely does give you that Wonder Woman feel. You can absolutely look anywhere you want. That display is put right there in front of you along with the night vision device, the heads up display, and targeting uh, and threat information. And so this kit has really got a lot of stuff coming into it. And what the pilots told me was that when they're flying at night on the tanker, you've got lights, you've got things that are coming off the tanker, you've got other aircraft that are in close proximity. And what they told me was the heat signature from the motors, the lights displays became very disorienting. And when you lift up the, the, that visor, if you did that in flight, you've got no data. You got nothing. There's no heads up display in front of you. You can look at the screens below you, but that's not in their habit pattern right now. And so what they have is a little bit of a conflict. This is, I know this sounds like it's very complicated air refueling, but it's kind of like you practice it so much as a fighter pilot that you've driven 30 miles on the highway and not remembered any bend in the road, right? You've all done that. And this is the same thing. When you practice air refueling enough times, it is a walk in the park. And so when you saddle up to the airplane, you look up, and now you can actually start taking your mind away, thinking about the tactical situation, what your next move is, how you're going to maneuver this 16-ship uh, package if you're the lead. You can do all of that while you're on the tanker. Well, this uh, HMDS has got some conflicts in it, and this is where the pilots told me that it was an issue. Is on the tanker, another administrative uh, chore. Fighter pilots generally don't think about landing, at least not Air Force fighter pilots. It's a taken for granted. You're gonna go in if the weather's bad. It's still, you go in there, this is what you do. It's not the mission. The mission is fighting. And so they had double vision at night landing because of the, the number of lights and the, and the brightness in and around the, the airfield, that became a, an issue. And so the HMDS is, is something that needs some work. And this is the, between the, in the whole system that I heard, this is the one thing that was recurring with the pilots is the, the HMDS. Would you go back, Will, to the number two slide? And that's pretty much the airplane. I, if I could go down a little bit of a, of a fighter pilot uh, lane, uh, it, this is a fun one to talk about. This airplane was given the, op, the, the name of a dog. It was, it was basically a dog in many people's mind for a long time. And, and they classified it that way because folks that were flying it had leaked out information that says it doesn't fly as well as the F-16 or the F-15 or the previous airplane that I flew. Well, when I flew with the Thunderbirds, or when you watch somebody fly in, in an air show, this is the kind of jet that you see. Underneath that F-16 on the lower left, it has no external stores, no missiles on the F-15 on the right. It has no pylons, no wing tanks, no ECM, uh, uh, electronic countermeasures pods, nothing. And we do that because one, it is fun, and two, you can max perform the airplane, right? It's something that you can go out and do. When we fight, BFM uh, go out and do that on a day-to-day -day basis in squadrons. Generally, we'll clean off the airplanes because you want to learn how to max perform the jet. 
and you want to gain that confidence. But this is all kind of a ruse, and it's a ruse for fighter pilots too because you have to think about what your combat configuration is going to be. And this is what the jets look like in a combat configuration. If you'll notice, the only jet that didn't change here is the F-35. Underneath the F-16 uh, center line there, right underneath the center of the jet, is an electronic countermeasures pod that weighs about 800 pounds. Uh, on the right side, you've got wing tanks. You've got we, oh, they, uh, basically weapons mounts. We called mouths, but they're basically stored uh, storage locations. Each one of those weighs a lot, and each one of those, when you're going through the air, it slows you down. The drag associated with it is significant. And so... When you go to combat, that's how you fly. Even if you're going to go and you're going to fight somebody air to air, that's how you start out. And now when you've got this long range contact and you see a bogey on the horizon on your radar and you start coming in, if you don't get a kill at distance and you think that other airplane is at least as good as yours, what you have to do is hit a button in the cockpit that jettisons everything that's, that's departable from the airplane. With that, the wing tanks go, the bombs generally go, but every other piece of, of metal out there is still hanging. The targeting pod, the uh, harm targeting system pod, the ECM pod, and all the rails and all of that stuff, and it really is a drag-laden airplane. Even the F-16, it changed the way those airplanes flew. And so this, ladies and gentlemen, that's the configuration that you need to be concerned with when you're talking about fighting for your life in a combat situation. Now look at the F-35 there. It's the same jet it was to begin with. The weapons are internally mounted. The missiles are internally mounted. It doesn't have any targeting pod that has, is mounted in the chin of the airplane internally. Every other countermeasure that you've got is all internal to the system. And so, Tom, this airplane is the, as clean as it is right now when it goes into the high-threat environments. And this is the airplane I asked pilots to rate. And when they were going through, it's kind of hard. Anybody who's, uh, I know Todd Harmer is out there, been to weapons school. There's several folks in the room that have been. Uh, General Orville Wright in the front. Yeah, when you go to weapons school, they make you fly in those configurations. And you have to learn how to fight somebody else who's clean in a dirty configuration. But most other pilots have to imagine that. And so this is what an F-16, and this is how the pilots rated the F-16. Up in the top, you can basically see the maneuvering capability of the airplane. And down below, those little purple bars going left and right, that's basically different um, air-to-air -air combat engagement type of situations. And if it's purple, more purple than it is white, that means that the guys picked, and the guys and gals picked the uh, F-35 over the F-16. As you can see there, almost every one of them picked it in most situations, but the very top line is really important because beyond visual range is when you're coming in and you get that contact on the nose at 50 miles, and now you can kill them at range or you may have to go in and you have to fight them in an old classic dogfighting sense. Every pilot that I interviewed, everyone from a fourth generation background said that they would pick the F-35 to be in in those long range contacts. And then when you get in the short range contacts, the reason why those numbers dropped is by and large because of the really capable missile that, that most Air Force airplanes have right now. It's called the AIM-9X. It's a dogfighting missile. You cannot carry the AIM-9X in a stealth configuration F-35. And so that weapon in a close fight is why those numbers drop a, a little bit in each one of the charted areas. If you've got a paper, you can look at each of the different systems the Air Force has. And by and large, the numbers dwarf what, what you actually get depicted there. If the F-35 had the AIM-9X in these situations, or I took it away from the F-16 in that situation, then the numbers would have changed. And they would have gotten even better for the F-35. And so this is the level playing field, Tom. Uh, long answer to your question, but that's the airplane. Oh, fascinating, JV. And so I, you were, we were talking the other day about why it's really not that important uh, close in because the other generations, fourth generation aircraft, are not going to survive to employ that AIM-9X. 
in anything closer than beyond visual range. You're exactly right. And so in a perfect world, um, there won't be a fourth generation airplane that touches it. The situational awareness cues in this airplane are phenomenal. We built our formations when I was an F-16 guy to fly side by side to where you could look and check the six uh, or the, the area that was harder for the pilot in the cockpit to see. And you would be in a position to turn, call that guy to turn, and then shoot a missile at that bandit that was coming in. Well, this airplane has so many sensors and external feeds that sneaking up on it is all but impossible, at least in, in a non-EMP environment that we, we live in on a day-to-day -day basis. And so having those cues and that allows this airplane to go and do some extraordinary things that we never thought about doing in the Viper. Thanks, JV. Let's talk about the simulator, the thing that the system that the uh, Air Force uses to help uh, add to the training that uh, pilots get to, to employ the F-35. Yeah, Tom, uh, can we go, Will, would you go back to slide number two, please? Uh, here you can see how I've uh, graphed that, and that's the second line down. Uh, the sim is, uh, when I asked the pilots to rate the sim, initially they all said it was great, and then I started asking questions. I asked questions like, tell me about the fidelity of the sim. Tell me how uh, the interface works. Um, do you always get a pristine picture in the sim, meaning that if, if it's out there in the sim, you always see it, whereas in an airplane, that's not always true. Uh, mountains obscure targets, for example, things that you would not necessarily see in your target on your radar. And so when I started asking those questions, what I found was the average pilot, and it's more than the average pilot, thought that the simulator was a really important training device for part task training, intercept training, going out and figuring out how to target uh, multiple four ships as you're coming in in a long range uh, situation, or going through the switchology of the airplane. And there are so many switches and so many screens that you can cycle through in the F-35, getting that down to where its rote is really important. And I'll, I'll go down at burrow a hold here just for a second, Tom. We call things in the, in the fighter community habit patterns. Uh, you, you know, when you're ready to turn final, you have already put the gear handle down. And that habit pattern is always ingrained in your head. And you never forget that. Well, when you're out fighting, this habit pattern of you've got so many switches on the throttle and stick and so many screens that you have to have time to where you don't have to think about, okay, I'm gonna flip that switch outboard and it will give me this display. You can't fight that way. You have to have this to where it's rote in your head. And that skill set, believe it or not, is volatile. So when you haven't parallel parked for three years and then you go in the city and try to parallel park in a tight spot, that's, that's tough. But when you do it every day, it's not as hard, right? Well, this is that thought process on steroids. And so for the switchology, the mechanization and the likes, the sim is a really good thing. And you can do classified engagements in the sim that you can't right now do in all um, range airspace on a live fly situation. People can look out and kind of detect and, and figure out what you're doing, and we don't want that. But the downside of the sim is kind of what I've alluded to. It's the ideal world. Uh, if they don't inject weather into your situation, it's, it's the perfect day. You're flying in a perfect day. When you're flying in a simulator and your buddy is flying in another room in a simulator, you see exactly what they see and they see exactly what you see. And there's no issues with this communication in between the two airplanes. That rarely happens in the air. And when it does on a consistent basis and then it doesn't happen, figuring out what went wrong is really hard to do. And so this is why the uh, ideal area of the simulator is, is an issue. But more important than that, it's the software. The software in the, uh, in the F-35 drives everything. So you think that you know, software tell, allows you to push the screen and, and, and the switch up causes the software to shift things. Well, it's everything. It's absolutely the screen, the presentation, every facet of the jet is built on software. Every threat that the airplane has in its inventory is on software and it's updated on a regular basis. So I'm gonna to try to describe something to you. It's a little challenging, but if I was to tell you that if you got within three feet of me, I could hit you, you'd want a kind of a bubble around me, right? And you go, I'm not gonna get inside of that bubble. Well, the, the F-35 does that for every threat. 
and it figures out that he says he's got this swing, but he can't see me. He actually can't see me until I get within two feet. And so that bubble that it displays around the threat on the screen or in your, in your visor is dynamic. It breathes with regard to where you are. So in an F-16, you know, you're, you're fighting someone head on and you've got a big radar cross section. You turn to the side and it gets even bigger because of how it was designed and how it wasn't so stealthily designed. In the F-35, with the stealth in play, if your nose on, it's all but invisible. I mean, to any radar out there for a long way. You turn to the side, it gets a little bit more visible. And so that threat ring expands when you've got a little bit more aspect. Does that make sense to, to you guys? This ability for a threat, a SAM, to detect you and then hit you with a missile, you want to know where that is, and it breathes, and that's all based on this threat library, the software that's inside of the jet. Right now, the software that's been fielded is a software called 3F. The average simulator that's out there, even in operational units, is two derivations earlier than that. And so the threat libraries haven't been updated. They can't, for example, in the, S, uh, the S-400 is the most significant threat that's out there, and the S-400 you can't actually uh, employ against that in the simulator because the system hasn't been updated to incorporate that yet. And so many of the pilots use this term. It provides negative training. Negative training means you build habit patterns that will get you killed in combat or allow you to be less effective in combat. And so while that wasn't everybody, it was a majority of folks who used that term. It's all almost negative training. And so uh, this is a challenge. You only have so much money. Most of the money goes into the airplanes. You want it there. And then the next dose of that money is going to go into the, the, uh, the simulators as far as the software goes. And it just takes a while to get that up to date. Historically, I was in the Air Force for a long time, and we had high fidelity sims, and the sims were almost always a generation or two behind the software that was in the jet. And I don't imagine that's gonna change with the F-35. And so this is an interesting one, but let me uh, go back to slide number seven, Will, if you would. And this is a uh, question that I asked. You can actually just hit seven and hit enter on that keyboard. Let's see, did I do that right? There it is. Um, I asked every pilot, okay, so the SIM, the Air Force says the SIM is a replacement for flying time in the jet, but it's almost that way, and it's going to get that way pretty soon. And this is the results. The red side of that is an absolute no. It does not replace the jet, time in the jet. And, and if you get the other ones, the next biggest chunk is they say for some things. Only, I think, one person in the entire poll said it, it replaces time in the jet, and that's out of the 30 folks that I interviewed. Time in the airplane is still the most valuable commodity. Excellent, JB. That, that was really good. Hey, lots of stuff in the press lately about maintenance, uh, logistics of the F-35. GAO came out with a big report, I think it was last month, talked a lot about issues with spare parts and stuff like that. I know you talked to maintenance people out at Hill Air Force Base. Can you describe to us what you found in your assessment? Yes, sir. Um, the Air Force bought a complete package. Uh, actually, all the services uh, in the uh, JSF, the J Joint Strike Fighter community, bought an entire package that involves a, a maintenance logistics piece called ALICE. Uh, it's the uh, Automated Logistics Information System, A-L-I-S. And ALICE basically is the thing that download, you, you plug ALICE into the airplane, it downloads all of the flight data. So if it had a malfunction, you plug it in and the, the jet will send the data into ALICE and ALICE will say, well, you need an empty frats part and you're gonna need 20 guys to, or two guys or one guy to replace this, it's gonna take three hours. It's a magical process on paper and it's going to take us just like the jet. It's going to take us a little longer to get there. Alice, they love several components of it. So you all have uh, worked on your cars at one time or another. At least I, my wife makes me work, work on our car all the time. And I'll buy a shop manual. And if the shop manual is really good, it will say something like, open the hood of the car is the first step. Okay, I open up the hood of the car. Now, check to see, and it goes through a step-by-step -step basis, and if it's really good, it'll have a picture or a diagram of what I should do and what, what I should remove, how I should put it back on. 
Alice has this um, JTD module. It's a uh, joint technical data module. And that has this on steroids. It's not just a checklist, but it has videos. It has diagrams. It has everything you need to go in and change it if you are a qualified technician on the airplane. It's an amazing system. With every new system that comes out, a new car, you think the wheel bearings are never gonna fail on the car, and, and it was designed to never have a wheel bearing failure, but lo and behold, the manufacturer didn't pr produce a good part, and that wheel bearing has an issue. And now, if you didn't plan for that in your manual, your shop manual, then you go, well, how do I replace this part? And that's where we are with any new system, and that's including the F-35. When the F-16 came out, it had a lot of failures. We lost a lot of jets over my time, early years in the jet, because of maintenance problems that we weren't expecting. Um, and once we figured out what those were, then we could actually start a schedule on when to replace those parts before they failed, and then have detailed schematics and joint technical data that was available that you could actually employ. And so the JTD data that's in this Alice mode is phenomenal, and no man maintainer that I talk to, and certainly the chief of maintenance out there, would not want to do without several of these modules that are so incredible. Um, it does have gaps in it, and those will have to be filled as this, the jet, we get more experience on the, on the airplane. There are other problems with the, uh, with the system, though, and, and you have programs that Lockheed Martin designed, digital programs that are working like a champ, but most of those go in and grab information from other programs, other modules in the system, and some of those are analog modules. And when those two meet, you very often have uh, system issues. And working out those bugs is gonna take a little bit longer time. So long answer to your question, uh, uh, maintenance is doing great. The jet is flying incredibly well. The average F-35 takes off and lands, and it has no discrepancies. They don't have to do anything other than top it off with gas for its next flight. That's all they have to do. It's actually much more than average. It's 92% of the time an F-35 takes off. It has no discrepancies. The next level is what we call the code two discrepancy. Hey, you know, my seat uh, height adjuster wouldn't go all the way up to the exact point that I wanted, but it still works and the next guy can fly it. A flyable, combat configured airplane is a code two airplane. A nitinoy irritant is what that would be. The code three failures require some maintenance action before they can fly again. And, and this is a, a, an area where as the F-35 gains more flight time and the maintainers get more experience on the jets, then that will smooth itself out. And so all in all, the jet's doing really good as far as maintenance goes, but we've got some gaps that we're gonna have to fill in with information. And um, uh, our office, uh, uh, the Air Force, our joint office on the other side of town, as well as each one of the bases is gonna have to work to, to fill those gaps as quickly as we can. Your report talks, and I'll get this wrong, but there were pilots that were troubled by some of the delays they had getting their aircraft back up for flight the next time. Can you just talk briefly about Yeah, it? and this comes back into that analog digital yeah. thing. You, you, because it's a new system, you have to download data before you can actually do anything else, including fly the airplane the next time. You want to make sure everything is working. And there were occasions that pilots talked about in a very disgruntled and four-letter way about not being able to fly perfectly good airplanes because the Alice system crumped. And so they've worked through most of those bugs and it's not happening now, but this is where those digital and analog ends meet. And, uh, and that, that's still, I imagine that's gonna be an issue for a little while longer. Great, JV. So the final area of assessment in your report had to do with the operations, how the Air Force is doing in bringing this aircraft into wings, into squadrons, how they're training on it. Can you talk about that? Well, uh, Tom, I'll tell you, you would be awfully proud of the, the folks at Hill. They have done everything they can do, and they've done it right. The maintenance folks have trained more maintainers than they need so that they can take those additional maintainers, move them to a new base as seed corn to bring the next wing that gets the F-35 up to speed faster. The F-35 operators, the pilots, have taken this time where the, 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 the sortie rates, because maintenance is a little bit slower, everybody's getting to learn how to new, uh, operate this and maintain this new jet. They're, they're operating a little slower, and so what they've done is they've done what most 
um, fighter weapon school graduates would be very proud of. They are doing one day long mission builds. So you do mission planning for an entire day. You brief the mission, you fly the mission, and then you go into every detail about the sortie that you possibly can. And, and that debrief will often take six to eight hours. That's what we did at weapons school all the time. And so they've taken advantage of the, the low sortie rates right now and operations has done a great deep dive and the average F-35 operator that's out there is really smart and he's really well schooled in the system. Unfortunately, they're not building experience as, as fast as they can. So pi fighter pilots in order to get better, you need more hours and you need more sorties. And in building that gives you not just um, the credentials somebody else needs to follow you, it gives you the skill sets that you need to have confidence to go out and lead folks. Over the years, we've developed this, this theory that even a knucklehead like me, if you give him 500 hours in a fighter, he can get enough experience where he can go out and lead people. He becomes quote unquote labeled experienced. Well, when you're only flying two, one or two times a week, you're not building that experience, that number of hours and the number of experiences through sorties that you need in order to become that pilot that you need to be to lead other folks. The sortie rates that the, the operators have capped because of these long um, mission preparation periods and long uh, flights and, and then debriefs, two days, taking two days out of the week for one sortie is a lot. And when uh, Orville Wright was my uh, ADO at uh, Torrejon, Spain, um, I was flying five or six times and he was cattle prodding me all the way along to get more time, to get more experience. And that doesn't mean you're taking a shallow dive. You're only getting the, exp you're, you're taking the nuggets that you need. And you're not talking about, I thought you taxied five knots too fast out there. You don't talk about the little things, you talk about the big things. And so the shift that the operation is gonna need to make, and, and this is a critical side uh, and, and a very small and nuanced side, the shift that the operator is going to need to make is to take those two days and, and do those on occasion, but that's not the thing you do every week, every sortie. You want to put one of those in a week, and then you want to get guys out there flying another three or four times a week, and that allows them to build the blocking and tackling skill sets that you need to go out and execute the big game. If you have a slow learner, they need a lot more repetitions. And Orville will be the first one to tell you, I needed a lot of bananas in order to be a, a better guy. But, but what we've done to date is we've hand selected every flight school graduate to come into this airplane, hand picked them. They're the best of the best in a flight school class or in, a pre in their previous operational unit. As the weapon system expands, we're not gonna have the ability to do that. And so you're gonna get John Venables in the unit and you're gonna need, them, need to feed them more bananas. And so that's the way I'll end. They're, they have done really an extraordinary job at Hill. This is just a tweak that I think they're gonna need to make over the, the next year or two. Yeah, so last question before we go to the audience and, and see what your questions are. And that is, there's kind of a, um, a baby elephant in the room, if you will, and that's got to do with the uh, Air Force's desire to purchase the F-15X, and I'm just interested, uh, in 2020 they asked to buy eight, and I think they aspired to buy 72 after that. I'm interested in having done this report, having talked to these pilots, what are your thoughts on that decision at this point? I'm sorry I didn't include this slide in the deck, but would you, Will, would you go to uh, five, slide five? Perfect. This is the F-16, F-35 comparison. And, and you can see that there, there are points on both the top chart and the bottom chart where people pick the F-16 over the F-35. Uh, maneuverability or dogfight situations, right? And, and so when you, if you were to look at the F-15E comparison to the F-35, and if you've got one of those reports, you can do it right now, you'll see that the numbers are flipped. And the F-15E pilots would never want to go back to the F-15E. This airplane dominates the F-15E in every category. Um, the, the weapons loadouts that people talk about, you can put 20 uh, missiles on an airplane, but if it never gets to the merge, if it never survives to, to fire one of those missiles, then that's what a high threat environment would mean to the F-15E. You're gonna load up a lot of missiles and you're gonna lose a platform and a human being because you sent them into a high threat environment. 
We, we can sit back and say, yeah, but you could use them in, uh, uh, to, to away from the high threat area and you could have them protect uh, tankers and, and uh, ISR platforms. Uh, that's true as long as they don't send their A-team, if the Russians don't send the uh, SU-57 after their stealth fighter or the, Jap or the Chinese send their J-20, their stealth fighter. That's what you send after assets like that. And the F-15E will never see them, and, and then we'll lose both the F-15E and the, and the Havocap, that high-value asset. And so for me, uh, I, I would sit back and look at the data that is in the paper regarding the F-15E. The F-15X is a mirror image of the F-15E with a couple of tweaks on motors, perhaps, and on weapons loadouts. But otherwise, it's a big radar reflector, and it's not going to be valuable in 10 years when we're done fielding the F-15X. Thanks, JV. Yes, sir. Very good. So let's uh, go to the audience here. If you don't mind, wait for the microphone. Uh, give us your name if, and if, an affiliation if you have one, and, and summarize your question, if you would, so that we can get as many in as we can. Yes, sir, right here in the front. Uh, morning, Tom. Morning, JV. Uh, thanks for your time. My name's Chris Orr, former Air Force Security Forces Officer. Uh, unfortunately, the Air Force wouldn't let me uh, be a pilot or navigator due to a depth perception deficiency, so they made me a, brown, a beret wearing ground pounding gun toter instead of protecting the birds. Thank also, you for doing what you did. Uh, yeah, I'm grateful. Sure Roger that. Also, speaking of uh, the F 16 Lockheed Martin, the previous three and a half years I worked for Sally Port Global, uh, teaming up at Lockheed Martin in support of the Iraqi Air Force's F 16 program at Balad Air Base. And last but not least, a former Heritage intern and loyal donor ever since. So, Chris, that, long travel side, yes. Chris, we love you. Go on. Thank you. Okay, so. Uh, on paper, at least, how does the F-35 stack up against those near-peer adversaries like the Russian Su-35 or the uh, Chinese J-20? Really good question. And so uh, if I cut to the quick and say we really don't know, I guess that would be uh, the answer that I could give you. The S-400 is the, the SAM system that everybody's afraid of. It's never been used operationally, so we don't know, right, uh, how good of a system it is against a, a fourth-generation fighter. We do know how it would do. We believe we know how it would do against the F-35, and, and it's not very good. It may be able to see it further out, but its ability to actually engage and hit the F-35 is not there, at least not yet, not in the open source. So you go to the J-20, and you, if you look at the J-20, there's a lot of similarities between the J-20 and the F-35 on the outside. Um, uh, on the inside, it's different. So stealth, we call, talk about stealth in terms of metal, right? You can't see it because you've got this shiny coating uh, uh, that's covered up by other stuff, and so you've got this stealth coating. But stealth is actually much more than that. Stealth is anything you can use to find me. So if I have a big beacon in my airplane and it's going off all the time and you've got a beacon detector and you've got something that can track and engage that beacon and kill it, um, then that's not stealth, right? It's only partial stealth. The F-35 is complete stealth. It's emissions. The way it uh, is emotes nothing um, is phenomenal. An F-35 cannot see an F-35. It's a very important statement, right? Can you see it with a, a heat-seeking ap uh, aperture? Yeah, you can in certain situations, but a European environment, a South Pacific environment where the humidity goes up or the weather comes up, then those IR devices go away. And so now coming back to your question, the J-20, they may have got some technology from us um, through pilfery. They may have done some of their own research, but I'll tell you the art and craft of making a stealth fighter is amazingly hard. It would be the equivalent of me showing you picture a picture of woodwork and you never having done work work and the tooling and, the, and, and getting in and not seeing what's underneath the cabinet, right? How the things are, are put together with regard to the legs and the likes. That's what's missing from anything you'll see in the J-20 or the, the, the SU-57 with regard from their ability to steal from us, right? You just don't get that craftsmanship. Um, I could tell you that, you, you know, all you need to do is iron a shirt and it'll look great. But actually ironing a shirt is its own skill set and you actually have to take the time to do that. Putting stealth coating on an airplane to where it makes the airplane not visible to radar or minimizes someone's ability to do that 
is its own art. Do I have confidence in the, uh, in the, uh, the uh, F-35? Oh, I, from what the pilots have told me, I've got a great deal of confidence in it. Do I have confidence that the Chinese and the Russians have been able to? I don't have that confidence. And so I would say we've, we've got a competitive advantage, at least for the next 10 or 15 years. We've got a big competitive advantage with the F-35. Great discussion today, JB. Thank you. Doug Rayburg from Air Force Association. Yes, sir. In your discussion with your pilots at the F-35, did they describe or did you ask them, were there other mission sets that the F-35 affords them that their previous aircraft may not have, uh, alluding to things like missile defense and other things of the future? Doug, great question. Um, this is a really deep dive, and I'm going to try to stay on the outside. But I talk to the pilots. I go, hey, don't you want to have a part task training ride where you go out and all you, you work on is basic fighter maneuvers? And they go, oh, we work on those every ride. They'll go out and they'll do one set maybe. Um, suppression of enemy air defenses. That was what the F uh, 16 uh, CJ was designed for, you know, and it's just so, such a hard thing for that airplane to do. And you can't, as an F-16 guy who never flew that mission, I would be lost if you put me in that airplane and actually asked me to employ uh, in the suppression of enemy air defenses or seed roll. But they do that on every sortie. Uh, they do DCA, they do OCA. Every mission set that we could, uh, I could have pulled out of my hat uh, during my day in the Air Force, they do it all. And they do it well. It's not one of those things where it's, as long as they get to practice, the, the suite of technology is amazing. The future of the airplane, this distributed aperture system, the thing that has ports that look all over and you can see other heat signatures, it can actually track satellites. I'm not kidding. It can actually see missile launches off of a, a, someplace like Vandenberg, 800 miles away. The ability of that, that system, its sensitivity is amazing and it's only gonna get better. Um, I think, uh, Raytheon just took the, uh, the DAS, the Distributed Aperture System, last summer. And, and from what I understand, it's going to double, triple, or quintuple the, the capacity and reduce the costs and maintenance uh, of that system by that measure. And so I, I, I'll throw that out as this is one little segment of that airplane. What's inside of it and what its capabilities are and what it is going to be like in 10 or 12 years is amazing. I promise you I'll stop my rant after I say this. Um, I, I asked F-16 pilots, I asked F-15 pilots, tell me about the F-35. On a scale of zero to five, how is it? And, and most every one of those pilots, bitter, uh, evil, mean fighter pilots that I, I happen to be a part of that community, they would say, it's really good. I go, okay, so give me a number, 3.8. Oh, it's really good, and it's 3.8. Yeah, I, I won't give anything a five until it's at its absolute peak of performance, and this airplane won't be there for another 10 to 12 years. And so when you look at the grades and you go, well, he obviously didn't grade the F-35 very high in this area, it's really fascinating if you took that blinder away, what you would get. Let me see if I can do that. Will, if you're still awake over there, go to slide number 10. So this one's a little bit hard to see, but if you see the triangles, you see the blue dots and you see the hollow dots on there. The hollow dots are where they rated their previous fighter in each one of these areas with regard to sensors, visibility and the likes in the jet. The, that, that was experienced pilots, but the triangles that are kind of upside down, that's where an inexperienced pilot rated that. And so we talked about um, the switchology and how you have to take time to learn this jet. Well, if you're learning it for the first time, you're not unlearning it from a previous airplane. The habit patterns that I had in the F-16 to go outboard to get to dogfight, to go inboard to get to missile override, those things that I know in my head are there and will always be there, they're also there in F-16 pilots that are flying this airplane right now. And so they have to overcome themselves in order to learn this new airplane. And the bias that's in there 
will never go away. It'll never go away. But if you look at what the, the new guys rated it, the people who were right out of flight school, really amazing how much different the numbers are and where they rated it. And this is where you kind of get the clean sheet thought process, or if, if, if I will. Um, so all of this is in the report. You're welcome to dive in. I'll leave you with that. Um, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thanks, thanks for the briefing. Otto Kreischer, Sea Power Magazine. Um, uh, Merv, uh, question here. One, on um, how would you say that what you learned about the F-35 is comparable to the other two variants, you know, the Navy and, and the Marine Corps? Most of what you talk about is aircraft specific. Oh, yeah. uh, so, if, you know, the performances you know, may be a little, a little different, I don't know, thing. The other was in your maintenance side, Parts has been seem to have been. Did your maintainers complain about the part supply no. that that you that they were getting? Uh, I think I'll, I'll stop at that. I'm sorry. Otto was your, your name, sir. Otto. Otto. Oh, two great questions, and the report touches on um, one of that one one side of that. But I'll, I'll answer both your questions. Is this report on the JSF, or is it on just the F? A 35A. It's only on the F-35A with a couple of caveats. Anything that has to do with avionics, sensors, all of that stuff is uh, across the board the same in each of the other jets. Now, if you look at the maneuvering uh, slide, go back to slide number five, if you would, Will. If you look at that, they're not the same. They won't even be close. And what are they for the, uh, the, the F-35B and what are they for the F-35C? I don't know. I haven't asked that question. Only the pilots that are flying it are asking that question. And this, coming back to something Tom injected earlier, how did I get access into uh, the F, uh, F-35 bases that I got into? I have a great relationship with the Air Force. I still am, uh, I went to fighter weapons school with General Goldfein. Um, my best friends are timing out as four stars right now. And so I asked and they let me go into their bases. They trusted me. Um, I don't have that trust with the, uh, the Navy, and I don't have that trust with the Marine Corps. And so maybe when they read the paper and they'll see that it's an honest thing, that's I want to go in and I want to get the gospel out. And I'll, I'll be willing to bet you uh, dollars to donuts it's good. Um, but I don't know, and I won't know until I get there. Second question, maintenance parts. I meant to touch on this, and, and I, I'm grateful for you, you bringing that up. Uh, parts is a big issue. Uh, it's not just the parts that are available on base, it's the warehousing of the parts, it's how far they are away, the limited number of parts that are in that entire logistical system, and maybe equally important is the average maintainer's visibility into where those parts are in the system. The in-transient visibility is not there. And so the most important guy at, um, for maintenance uh, is the maintenance group commander out at Hill for that location. And he can't tell you when you order a part, um, Alice says it's gonna be here in four days and two hours, and Alice schedules your people for you. So you get Tom, you get Orville, you get Doug, you get Jamie, and you take your best maintainers to go over to this really hard fix, and they're gonna be there in four days and four hours when this part shows up. Well, the part doesn't arrive that day. When's it gonna show up? Well, that's really hard to figure out. And so this side, the logistical pipeline is really complicated. And if you think I'm making light of it, I'm not. If you think I'm throwing rocks, I'm not. This has gotta be fixed. Um, the ability for maintenance to outproduce aircraft for operation, operators to fly right now is alive. They, they produce more flyable aircraft than, than the pilots at Hill Air Force Base can fly right now. And yet, they're struggling with parts. So think what they would do when this system is fully up to speed. And it, they have these updates that come out uh, for software that goes into Alice. They're big drops and they come out about every year. And, it, and the next one is supposed to come out, I think, um, JR, do you know when it's gonna come out? September. And when that drop is coming out, I gotta tell you that everybody, every maintainer at the Hill Air Force Base, is they can't wait. Because the last update was so much better than the previous one and they're really banking on this one actually coming in and fixing the major things that are left to fix in the system. That was a long answer, wasn't it? Yes. Sir. It was, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'll 
Jay, thank you very much for a great presentation. Major General Cesar Wisniewski, Polish Defense Attaché, humble F-16 pilots and big lover of the F-35. We're in the process right now working on a LOR for this platform. However, um, you know, I, I really appreciate your approach, you know, just an uh, interview with the pilots because everything is classified about this platform mm -hmm. and we struggle a lot. There is a country which signed up the contract and doesn't have a classified briefing about some sensors yes. or, you know, uh, so it's not very... Um, comfortable for a community, you know, to encourage our bosses, you know, to spend a lot of money for this platform. So thank you very much for that. Yes, sir. It, it helps me a lot. And like I said, there is a lot of marketing, but not real, real capability available, even though in a community. So that's kind of, kind of, you know, something which built our awareness about the platform. But I would like to ask you about this um, virtual constructive a live virtual constructive ah. concept. You ah. know, the, the cost of uh, flying the, the new platform is very high, and I know the Lockheed Martin is working to reduce it to $25,000 per hour, which is, you know, great number if you compare with some other platform. But still, uh, many countries like Israel, Italy, you know, they work in very hard of this, like, virtual constructive, actually to reduce the number of the sorties generated as a training aid or, you know, the red forces, for example, you can do a lot of it in computers. Mm -hmm. How the F-35 actually, the simulators are uh, designed to help with, you know, in this area? Thank you. Well, that's a great question. So uh, if I come back to the bottom line is how are the simulators designed to help in this world? So um, live virtual constructive basically takes airplanes that are flying, and airplanes that are on the ground, and then it adds a simulation program in, in the middle of that that will throw out threats, that will throw out uh, enemy fighters, and they will all be woven in together. Live, virtual, constructive. Um, the F-35 has this constructive, it has this piece inside of the airplane. Um, and it, what it is is a program, and you, in, as, a, as an operator, can go in and say, I, when I fly into the area, I want an S-400 or an S-300 to trigger. I want it to alert the formation, and I want it to target everybody in the formation. And so you get to the point, and it does this for you, right, which is pretty amazing. Now, let me set that aside and say, in the simulator, you have a simulator operator, and he's looking, and he's going, eh, that looks about right. Okay, he's crossing the line, and he hits the button and says you're illuminated by um, uh, an S-400, one of its some components. And, and you go, well, that's great. And then when he fires a missile at you, he goes, well, looks like you did everything right. The missile missed you. Or, oh, you didn't, the missile hit you. All of the calculations, all of the estimations are on the back of the simulator. There's no automation. And really, this is a huge gap, right? This is a huge gap. Now, let's go to real world. I'm out flying the F-35. The, the F-35 knows everything about itself. It knows when it turns this many degrees away from you. It knows what its radar cross-section that it's giving. How how easily it is for you to target me or how hard it is. And it knows what your missile range is. It knows how fast that missile flies. And it can give itself a, a, a probability of survival, if you will, right, in the, in the airplane. Not that you would have to do that real world, but it, it can do that through its threat library. So the jet does it all. The simulator, the simulator operator has to do, yeah, that looks about right, and literally that's what it is. The probability of kill, oh, you didn't execute this exactly right, and I think the radar cross-section would have given you away, you're dead, right? Now, let's go to the constructive piece, this, the, the piece that's in the middle of the software. Now, the, that software, you have to tell the system when to turn, turn it on, and you have to tell it the other, the other attributes of you. So you have to give it all. It does not take the threat library from the airplane that that program is resident in. It, you have to tell it just like you're a simulator operator back home. On top of that, it's really hard to load all of that stuff up. When you're sitting down and you're trying to mission plan, it's very archaic. You actually have to send somebody to school to learn how to operate this little program. And the guys who've been to that school, hate the program. It's really hard to use. It's very cumbersome and they don't like it. So these three pieces are there and they function relatively well together. 
with a couple of exceptions. The simulator, they have this uh, distributed mission training thing uh, where you can actually fly a sim and your buddy can fly a sim and his buddy and his buddy. A maximum of four simulators. It's a maximum of four. The F-35 doesn't fly with four ships. By and large, it's much larger packages than that. And so you don't have the opportunity in the mission training module right now that's out there that, that needs to be expanded. Now, is that going to be expanded? It is, but it's coming very slowly. The first uh, location, I think, JR, is going to be uh, Nellis Air Force Base, I think, is the first place that gets this expanded uh, distributed mission training uh, module uh, to where you can go to, I think, 16 airplanes. And so all told, you've got the components there, but we need to make some more investments. And let's go with this embedded training module, the program that's in the airplane. Um, because of the, uh, the challenges in funding through sequestration, the gutting of funding from another ways, and the cost overruns of the program, you actually took this embedded training program and you reduced its capability significantly. It was going to do all this magical stuff, but now it's, it's basically where I told you. It's very archaic. It's very hard to use. And so if uh, the Joint Program Office threw a little bit more money at this and, and actually had that, that program pull the threat data from the threat library, right from the airplane, it would be a real simulation if they could make it where you plug and play. You just put these airplanes, the, this, these uh, SAM threats and these fighters out there, and you just drop them on your mission training uh, program then it would be so much easier to use and it would reduce the mission planning time that, that crews would need to do. So it would be a complete solution. You'll find all that in the paper. Um, but uh, the, coming back, I, did I answer your question? Well, but just to clarify one thing, is it possible to fly in a simulator as a training aid against the real plane flying air? Because that's one of the, you know, almost 25 to 30% of our mission in F-16 community is just training aid. I believe you that's right. JR, can you answer that question? Yeah, the, the LVC um, concept is there. It has not been put into practice with an F-35 or really anything else. Uh, Nellis Air Force Base is where the focus has been for a number of years on how we do live virtual constructive training, but um, nobody has cracked that egg completely yet. Yeah, so the parts and pieces are there. It just hasn't been put together yet. Long answer. Any other questions? So I spent a little bit of time. What time is it? We've got a, a, just a, another minute or two. I spent a little time talking about how much flying time that people needed. Um, and what the, I actually asked this question. If, if you had the opportunity to fly more, would you? And most guys said, well, you know, I've got a lot of extra additional duties. I got a lot of this. And I go, okay, let me, let me turn this around for you. When I was flying, I needed a lot of bananas and I needed them on a recurring basis. And so if you, if you gave me two sorties a week, two bananas, I, I probably got worse at everything, just a little bit. I, it, it took me a while to remember uh, exactly how to go do it. I had to think about maneuvering my airplane to go beat somebody else. If you gave me three sorties a week, then I, I actually could sustain all of the things that you asked me to do pretty well. But if you gave me four sorties a week or more, I got better at everything. And it's the repetitive nature of this. And over the course of my Air Force life, this has been the mantra that most fighter pilots have said, two, three, and four. Does that still apply? I asked that to every F-35 pilot that I met. And what they gave me uh, was pretty startling. Uh, slide number eight. And so does this two, three, four mantra apply? Now, if you look at the experienced pilots, you'll see that 17 of the 21 that I asked said absolutely, and four of them said you could probably reduce that number by one. These are very experienced pilots. All of them have uh, in excess of 800 hours of fighter time in another fighter and two to 300 hours in the F-35. But look at the center. Every first assignment fighter pilot said that. Every one of them said that. And so when you begin to think that you have all the answers because you're experienced and you've kind of lost sight of how many bananas you needed as a young person in order to get to, to do the mission, it's easy for you to step aside. Now, I'll do a quick uh, question. 
How many sorties a week do you think the average Air Force fighter pilot is getting right now? You think he's getting two, three, or four? Uh, go to slide nine, just go to the next slide. This is disheartening. So if you look up there, the average F-35 guy got 4.2 sorties a month last year. That's one a week. It doesn't even get to two. Uh, 20, F-22, five sorties a month, 1.25. And then if you look at the hour totals, this is really discouraging. When I was uh, uh, getting ready to fight the, uh, the Soviet hordes during the Cold War, we knew that the average guy needed 200 hours a year. And even experienced guys, if they got less than 150 hours of flying time a year, you couldn't take them to combat because they would, one, not survive, and two, probably take you down because of their inabilities in the airplane. Their lack of mutual support that they could provide because they were saturated with their tasks. Look at how many fighter pilots got more than 150 hours last year. That's where we wouldn't take anybody to combat, that threshold. And only the F-15E community on average made it above that in 151 hours a year. This is something the Air Force needs to turn on, and, and it's something that we will highlight again. But if you're in the aviation community and you've got the, a, a fighter background at all, you know that these numbers resonate. They resonate hard and fast. And, and we're at a point right now when guys are getting one sortie a week, you're having to think about everything. And, and if you remember, there was a movie, Right Stuff, a couple of years ago. And one of the astronauts got in the cockpit, and he's by himself, and it's Alan Shepard, and I think his prayer was something like, Lord, please don't let me mess up today, only he didn't use the word mess up. When you get in an airplane and you're flying one sortie a week, one of the things that you're thinking is, Lord, please don't let me mess up. And we're putting these kids in a square corner, we need to get them out of it. And so I'll leave you with that. Is any other questions? Tom, do you have anything that else came, that came to mind? Yes, sir. Thank you very much. My name's Todd Wiggins. Uh, uh, my site's called Meet Me DC. So I have a pedestrian question, which I don't believe has been covered. But um, with respect to vertical takeoff yes, sir. versus traditional long range uh, ascent and decline, do you have a preference and have you um, any thoughts about the future as, as to how viable vertical takeoff will continue to be? That's a great question. So um, the, the F-35B uh, is the Marine Corps variant, and it's what's called a Stovall variant, short takeoff, vertical land. And so it needs a, um, maybe a thousand feet, maybe a little bit longer runway than that in order to take off with a full load of gas and munitions. And then when it comes back, because it's burned all, off a lot of its gas and dropped a lot of its munitions, it can come back into a vertical landing. Uh, the Marines have had this as uh, in their, their uh, uh, requirement bin since they got the Harrier. And they are still flying the Harrier and they love it because of that's ability to go forward, be close to their troops, and you can have uh, a jet basically take off vertically or nearly so, go out in a very short distance, em employ that ordinance, and then come back and, and, and land. And do that over and over and get a lot of repetitions in and help their guys on the ground. Right? And so um, I, do I think that this is a viable um, argument? I love the argument. I love it. Uh, I, I, would, I would love to give the Marines as many of those airplanes as they want. The Marines are also buying the C model, which is the, uh, the, the carrier version with a lar larger wing that's not um, vertical uh, takeoff and land. Um, but what their, their basic number one premise is the guys and gals on the ground. Our job is to support them. Our job is to be there and in turn as quickly as we can and get as close as we can to that fight as we can. If you look at uh, another very odd uh, argument, Todd, is I want as many targets um, for the enemy to shoot at as possible. I, I know that's a horrible thing, but I want them to be so saturated with the number of avenues that I can, as a United States um, airman or a United States military person, I want to be able to hit them from so many directions that they have to defend in all of them. And by having this Stovall platform, I have that many more directions that they have to defend. 
Uh, is it, uh, does it reduce your carriage of munitions? It does. Does it reduce your, your performance with regard to how the airplane operates? It does. Uh, your gas, it reduces all that stuff. There are trade-offs. Um, and last thing I'll say is John Jumper back in 2002, 2004 timeframe actually was going to buy a, a B model variant for the Air Force to replace the A-10. And, and the reason why he was gonna do that in my head anyway, was that you wanna preserve that incredible community we've got with the A-10. They do air to ground, they do close air support, it's their bread and butter. Anybody can go out and drop in a low threat environment, uh, uh, and even I can do that and have, where you can employ where there's nobody shooting at you. But when there's somebody shooting at you, you have to know the mindset, you have to know the nomenclature, you have to know everything about the people that you're supporting and the people that you're trying to kill on the other side. And our A-10 guys do that, and I think that's one of the reasons why General Jumper was leaning in that direction, was to preserve that community. J.D., before you leave, on behalf of the Air Force Association, Tom, thank you. Um, too often in this town, we talk about those who would risk their lives as we approach Memorial Day. JB, thank you very much because you went and talked to those who are going to give their lives for our country and you gave them a voice. So on behalf of our Air Force Association, brother, thank you very much. Thank you very much. That's beautiful. Well, thank you, sir. Very, very grateful. And with that... Uh... Yeah, so any final questions? Thank you so much for coming today. Have a great weekend. I think there's a lunch in the lobby and uh, let's give one final round of applause to JV.